Amen. All right, we're in Galatians chapter number 6. Look down at your Bibles at verse number 13. It says, For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised, that they may glory in your flesh. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. The title of the sermon this morning is The Vain Glory of False Testimonies. The Vain Glory of False Testimonies. Testimonies. Now, here in Galatians chapter 6, we have the Apostle Paul making a statement that you see frequently throughout his epistles and his letters. And one of the things that he constantly says, and he rewords it differently in different letters, is that God forbid that he should glory, but he's going to glory in the cross of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Well, it basically means that he wants to honor, he's going to extol, he's going to brag on the cross of Christ, right? He's going to brag on Jesus. He's not going to brag about himself. He's not going to talk about all the things that he was able to overcome to be saved. He's not going to talk about how, what a wicked person he was or the things that he used to do when he's preaching the gospel. When he's preaching the gospel, what is he doing? He's preaching Christ and him crucified is what he's doing. And what does he do when he does that? Well, the Bible tells us that he's not glorying in himself. He's glorying in the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, obviously, I'm preaching this because we just uh, excommunicated these two freaks out of our church who basically were doing this. They were, they were glorying in their past. They were glorying in who they were or actually who they still are, right? But the fact of the matter is, is that the work that Jesus did for us on the cross, that's what really we should be focusing on. That's why when we talk about soul winning, we don't, we don't tell people, hey, make sure you get your testimony down locked. Make sure you tell people who, who you used to be, what you used to do. That stuff means nothing right. when we're out preaching the gospel. You know, no one cares if you did drugs back in the day when you were like, when you're preaching the gospel. What you should be preaching is Christ and Him crucified. What you should be preaching is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You should be talking about the gospel, the fact that they're sinners, that there's a hell that they deserve to go to, but that Jesus Christ died for them, and that all they have to do is believe in order to be saved, in spite of who you are. So he wasn't going to glory in his past, and this is in stark contrast to those who, who, whom he's referring to, which are the Pharisees, right? Right? Because Pharisees glorified themselves all the time. You know, that they fasted and that they gave tithes of all the mint and rue and everything. And that, you know, they're of the seed of Abraham. Their reputation or their confirmation that they were God's people was their, that they were descendants of Abraham, right? According to the flesh. Well, they're glorifying themselves in things that don't even matter. In fact, go with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. They were glorying in their own flesh. And look, here's the funny thing is that the Pharisees, even though they gloried in their flesh, they're a bunch of hypocrites. They didn't even do the things that they said they were doing. They're a bunch of hypocrites. They didn't do the things that they said they were doing. They were breaking the commandments. They were breaking the law. You know, they were telling people, laying heavy burdens on people, but they themselves weren't even carrying out those commandments. You know, what is that called? It's called a hypocrite. So when you hear someone like these freaks who came to our church, Say, oh, you know, you know, we used to do this and we used to do that, but we overcame it. They're still doing it. They're still doing it. They have this holier than thou, overly spiritual, hypocritical attitude. And I find it funny that they're calling me a Pharisee when they're actually the ones who are guilty of this garbage. Look at Matthew 3, verse 9. It says, And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Who is he talking to? The Pharisees. When they came to John, they didn't say, Hey, we believed on the Lord. Right? What's your testimony? Oh, we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. We're no longer in Judaism. We're no longer Pharisees. We're saved. Right? What do they say? No, we're, we're sons of Abraham. Go to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. John chapter 8 is one of the most disrespectful things that Jesus Christ has ever said to the Jews. Okay? And look, the book of John is a very lovely book. It's a book for believers. But often it's actually some of the, it tells some of the most condemning things about the Jews from the mouth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at uh, verse 39 of John, John chapter 8. It says, They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto him, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. He's like, it's funny. It's funny you say you're of Abraham's seed because actually you're trying to kill me. 
So how does that look? You know, just like these bunch of reprobates who they want to say that they're saved, but they want to come and threaten and fight me. I'm like, oh, that's funny you say that. Funny you say you're a Christian. Funny you say you're more godlier than me when you want to come and fight me. But this is the attitude of those who have these type of testimonies, right? Now, go, to Galatians, go back to Galatians 6, verse 1. What does it look like when someone's glorying in themselves? What does that actually look like? Well, look at Galatians 6, verse 1. It says here, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one, another bur one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. This is in context of what we read later on. So people who glory in themselves, they think that they're something. You know, they think they're all that in the bag of chips. They think they're basically saying when they give you their testimony, look at the catch that Jesus got. Who's the one that benefits from the, from the salvation? Not themselves, Jesus. Right. Oh, because Jesus saved this crack addict, this heroin addict, you know, this drunkard, this fornicator. No. The Bible's telling us here that these people are deceiving themselves. Now, there are people today that have that same vain glory. They want to glory that they were former drug addicts, murderers, criminals, or whatever. And look, there may be people in here who are guilty of drugs, you know, being fornicators. And I'm not talking about you because, to be quite honest with you, I don't know who you are. You know what that shows is that you're not glorying in it. Because here's the thing, one thing that saved people have that these freaks don't have is what? Shame. You think we want to talk about the things that we did in our past as if it's a good thing? Oh yeah, I used to do all kinds of stuff. I was involved in this and that. That's a shame. It's a shame to speak of those things which are done in them in secret. But you know what? The people who don't, out, don't have shame are those who foam out their own shame. Those who don't care about you know, who it may defile, who it may offend. They just blur stuff out and they just want to let everyone know because they want to make it seem as though Jesus Christ got himself a good catch. Okay. And look, most of the time, these people focus on the sins that they repented of, don't they? Just like these guys we just booted out. When we asked them about their salvation testimony, he didn't say, I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ two years ago. He just said, my testimony is this. I got saved from this. It's like, so what are you saying, that you, you didn't do those things before? And you say, why didn't these people tell you that they were involved in that thing that they told that other person? Because they're trying to recruit people, that's why. They have an agenda to defile the minds of the people. They're going around seeing who is the young Christian in Christ, right? They knew that Damien was a young Christian in Christ. You know, that he was a young, that he was a babe in Christ. So that's exactly who they look for to try to defile their minds. Okay. Well, that's my testimony. Well, look, I don't care about your testimony. Amen. Tell me what you're going to do in the future. Let's talk about what we're going to do. Let's talk about the soul winning that we're going to accomplish. Let's talk about the salvations that we're going to see in the future. Let's not dwell on the things of the past. Now, groups that are notorious for this is like Victory Outreach. Yep. You guys know about Victory Outreach? The Cholo Church? <laughs> that's what it is. It's like a cholo church is what it is. Bunch of people who, you know, they, they, uh, they got saved in prison. You know, they get saved in prison. Then they come out and, you know, they no longer wear the long socks. They actually wear like dickies. They go all the way down with dress shoes, you know. And they often are these, these, these guys who focus all on repenting of your sins. They don't have the right gospel. They're self-righteous as the day is long, you know, and they're like these street preachers on the corners of East L.A. preaching to people how they need to repent of their gangster lifestyle. Look, I know people who are saved who are gangsters and they're not in church because they're still living their wicked life and God's chastising them and they're not happy about that. These guys want to make it seem as though they're still gangsters. You know, OGs for the Lord. That's wicked. Amen. Forget that stuff. Look, we're new creatures in Christ, amen? amen? We ought to be working on becoming more holier. We ought to be working on living a life that's pleasing unto the Lord, forgetting those things which are behind and pressing forward to those things which are before. Amen. Victory Outreach, Calvary Chapel, 
Pentecostals where they want to focus on your testimony. Okay, what's your testimony? Well, I got a testimony. You know, God saved me from being a whore. I used to sleep around day in and day out with all kinds of men. Who wants to hear that garbage? No one does. Don't divulge that nonsense to us. I don't want to hear about your, your, uh, your, your nights of where you've gone out and did all kinds of wicked stuff. I don't want to hear about your drunkenness. I don't want to be here about your drug addiction. I don't want to hear about your problems in the past. I don't want to hear about it. That stuff is filthy. I want to keep my mind clean. I want to keep the mind of our children clean. That stuff is not pertinent to the things that we're doing today. Look, and I'm not saying there's, there's probably people here who struggle with those things, you know, and after salvation, they started cleaning up their lives and they got victory over some of those things. Amen to that. But you know what? Those same people, they don't go around telling people what they used to do. And in fact, when they do, they're very subtle about it. They're very general about it and they don't go into detail which is going to be a point that I'm going to go over in just a moment. You know, these ex-gang members that get saved and, you know, in prison, they want to turn over a new leaf. They base their salvation in their ability, right? How much they cleaned up their lives. It's vainglory of a false testimony is what it is. You know, when I add, look, we, and we're screening people so much the more now. So you better get this thing right. We want to know. When did you get saved? And, you know, when we talk to you about when you got saved, the words that should come out of your mouth is, I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, maybe a, a couple weeks ago, maybe last year. You know, I heard a sermon or a soul winner came. That's it. And then after that, you say, you know, I used to be involved in like gangs or I used to be involved in drunkenness, but, you know, I heard some sermons that cleaned up my life. And man, I, I, want, to, I want to get in church. I want to become a soul winner. I want to go forward for the Lord, you know. But people who do that, they don't, they don't give all the details of, you know, the, their throw up and their parties and all the nonsense that they partook in. This is vainglory. They have zero shame in what they did. Now, now let me just say this, okay? Because we have a young church and we have a lot of people who are first generation Christians. So you know what that means is that we probably have a lot of people who were involved in those things in times past. Okay, whether it was a party lifestyle, drunkenness, smoking weed, fornication, you know, maybe you were divorced prior to getting saved or after or whatever. You know, you had a rough background before you even got into church, but, you know, you're starting to clean up your life. I'm not condemning anybody like that because, look, I got saved when I was 21 years old. So what did you do before you got saved? The things that 21 year olds do. <laughs> You fill in the blank. I was a 21-year-old living in Long Beach, living a worldly lifestyle with my gangster buddies. That's it. You can fill in the blanks when it comes to that. Right. You know? And look, after I got saved, and look, I would say I'm a rare case. And this is the reason I'm saying this. Because after I got saved, I started cleaning up my life right away. And I'm going to explain to you how I was able to do that and why... The, these elements that I'm going to share with you were basically the reason why I was able to clean up my life basically so well. Like I got rid of a lot of my friends. I got rid of a lot of the habits. And this is the reason why. When I got saved, I came to church. I got saved under the preaching of Bob Gray Jr., not senior. I always got to make that disclaimer. Bob Gray Jr., the guy who's still right with God. He's preaching the right gospel and everything. I got saved under his preaching. I was at Pacific Baptist Church. I got saved and right away, I just started going to church. And you know what? The preaching was hot. <laughs> my father-in-law preached against sin. And you know what it made me do? It made me want to clean up my life. And not only that, but I got into soul winning right away. Which, guess what it did? It, it gave me new friends. So the reason I was able to get rid of my old friends, you know the old friends that I learned all the bad habits from? The reason I was able to do that was because I got new friends. It's called the principle of replacement. We believe in replacement theology, amen? It's the principle of replacement. So I got new friends. I was in church. I got new friends. And let me, let me tell you, don't throw your tomatoes at me. One of the main reasons why I was able to clean up my life so quickly. And look, I'm not perfect still. There's things that I still struggle with. There's things that I still need to clean up for my life. Areas of my life that I'm still growing in. But the, one of the reasons I was able to get rid of those things is because a month after I got saved, I went to Bible college. Oh! 
Yeah. Yeah, I know. You know what, though? A month later, I went to Bible college, and Bible college was good for me. I know you don't want to hear that, but it's, it's fact. And if it wasn't for me going to Bible college, you, you wouldn't have me here today. You know why? Because Bible college, even though Bible college was garbage doctrinally, they had rules that I had to abide by. They had structure. They taught me when to wake up, when to go to sleep, how to work. You know, they, we were refrained from doing certain things that, you know, other people were not. And you know what? That was good for me. The structure that Bible college gave was good. Now, obviously, these things should have been taught from the pulpit, and I just should have learned it in church. But because they weren't, they had the Bible college there. I went there, and it gave me a lot of structure, and it, ref it helped me to, be to refrain from doing certain things. I did that consistently for five and a half years. I was in Bible college. Yeah, I was there for that long. And you know what? By the time I graduated, most of my friends had moved away. I was away from those things. And you said, did, did, oh, well, when you first got saved, did you, are you saying that you, you, you didn't have a desire to do those things? Well, you know what? And immediately, no, I didn't because I had like this love for the things that was new to me. But that's not to say that months after I didn't struggle because I, I'm still in my flesh. So months after I got saved, yeah, there was a temptation. But you know what Bible college and church taught me is that you burn certain bridges so that when you're tempted to go back, you can't. And here's the reason why people backslide so frequently is because you haven't burned the bridges. Look, I've told it before and I'll say it again. You know, my major stumbling block was my friends. My friends influenced me to do bad stuff. So I knew that was going to happen. So at the height of my being spirit filled, I said, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of all the numbers for my friends, all their phone numbers. So that I'm not tempted to call them when I'm, when I'm weak. And then just take it a step further, I got a new number so that they can't call me. So that way I burned that bridge completely down so that when I was struggling, guess what? I couldn't contact them. They couldn't contact me. I was just forced to be wherever I was at and just plow through that time of discouragement, depression, whatever it may have been. And I was able to, you know, stay alive spiritually speaking. So, you know, one of the things that helped me as soon as I got saved was that I got plugged into church. But look, <coughs> desires come and go, don't they? If you're not reading the Bible, if you're not walking in the spirit, those desires to do wicked things are going to come back. Those desires for the bad habits or your, your, your old lifestyle are going to come back if you're not constantly trying to walk in the spirit, being in church, doing so many, reading your Bible, praying. You, gotta, you have to do those things if you're going to keep that, that stuff alive. You can't feed the, the old man is what I'm saying. So what I'm saying is this, is that some people are able to turn over a new leaf quickly. But you know what? If I never did those things, or I'm sorry, once I turned over a new leaf, so to speak, when I first got saved, when I was out soul winning, and even to this day, I never gave my testimony. Never. Because we, we were taught that that's not the gospel. We were taught when you go out soul winning, hey, that's great that God did this for you. And then God is helping you through these things, through your church, through the preaching, through the Bible. But when we're out going soul winning, you don't give your personal testimony because it's not pertinent to what we're talking about. And look, when you do those things, you're not glorifying Jesus. You're glorifying yourself. You're trying to show people how holy you are, how great you are, and what a catch the Lord Jesus Christ got because he got some heroin addict, crackhead. The people, look, what about the people who never even involved in that stuff? What about the people you talk to who find that disgusting? They're just going to be like, I don't want to talk to you, Victory Outreach member. I don't want to talk to you, a recovering drug addict, if that's what you're, you're all about. We're here to give the gospel. Because here's the thing, when it comes, at the end of the day, we all, people who are saved, we all have that same testimony. Which is what? Jesus Christ and Him crucified that we're all saved from hell. That's it. Look, if that's the testimony you're talking about, amen to that. I'm good with that. If your testimony is, yeah, I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and God saved me from hell, then Amen. But you know what? Don't come at people with this garbage. Oh, God saved me from drunkenness. Well, no, he has not saved you from drunkenness because we're still waiting to win the redemption of our body. 
Drunkenness is a sin that is committed through our flesh, which we still live in. So he has not saved you from fornication yet. He has not saved you from drunkenness. He has not saved you from drug addiction. You will battle that for the rest of your life if that was you. And we're still waiting to wit the redemption of our body. Redemption means salvation. We're still waiting for our salvation. Our souls are eternal and secure. The Bible says that we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise unto the day of redemption of the purchased possession. So you know what that means is that our soul is saved, but guess what? This flesh is still wicked. This flesh still desires the wickedness. You say, well, how do you explain that then? You know, you say you don't desire certain things. Well, you know what? That's because I'm trying to walk in the spirit. And when you walk in the spirit, you crucify the lust of the flesh. But you know what? If you start feeding the flesh, zombie apocalypse. That dead man comes back to life and starts trying to overcome you. Then you don't read your Bible. You start hanging out with your buddies, smoking weed, drinking, doing things you ought not to because you're allowing your old man to reign over you. So it's a constant battle that takes place over a lifetime. So don't say, oh, yeah, God saved me from this. No, he didn't. He saved you from the consequences of those sins, which is hell. He did not save you from fornication. Because you're still, you look like you're still living. And we're still waiting to wit the redemption of our body. You understand? And look, that's why it's important that we practice this principle. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We got to practice the principle of replacement. Okay. Now, I don't want to discourage anybody from going to people and say, yeah, I used to be involved in this. What I'm saying is, you know, sometimes saved people can have a tendency of doing that. But you know who really does have the tendency of doing that? It's wicked people like the guys we just threw out. Because they have no salvation testimony. They have no legitimate salvation testimony because they don't know the Lord. They're wicked people. And look, these guys that we just threw out, they are reprobates. Through and through. Wicked, disgusting reprobates. I hope they die. Amen. And if they watch this sermon, I want you to die. Amen. I'm praying that God strikes you dead, you filthy faggot. Amen. I want those guys to burn quickly, to burn in hell. And you know what? You can't tell me you're not afraid of hell. You know you're going there because you're wicked. Because you hate the Lord. That's why. They know they're going to hell. You think these people are innocent? You think these people don't know anything? No, they come to infiltrate. Right, 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 right. They come to infiltrate, to defile, to destroy our church. Not on our watch. Amen. I hate them with perfect hatred. Amen. And since, since the day that I found out that they're a bunch of filthy reprobates, I've been praying, God, please destroy them. Amen. Please kill them. Right. Please, you know, some of those earthquakes that are taking place, please just open up the earth Amen. and just let them fall straight straight into hell quick into hell Amen. so they don't harm any other church right. I don't care if they're boxers they can box their way down to hell Amen. see how good that does you when you fall into hell you filthy reprobate Mom. trying to strike fear in the hearts of God's people look we're not afraid to die Amen. Amen. because to me to live is Christ and to die is gain buddy Amen. you're afraid to die you're afraid to die because you know as soon as you do, you're going to hell. And I pray that God gives me the privilege to judge your butt on judgment day and throw you into the lake of fire. Amen. Disgusting. What was I talking about? <laughs> I forgot. First Corinthians chapter 1. Let's just go to the Bible here, okay? Verse 26, it says here, look what it says. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of this world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things that are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to not things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. So we're not telling you, hey, don't glory. Just don't glory in yourself. You glory in the Lord. 
You know, Jesus did all the work for you. Jesus died on the cross for your sins. Jesus went to hell for three days and three nights. Jesus Christ resurrected from the grave three days after. You know, he was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. But I find it interesting that there's people out there who just want to partake in that salvation, don't they? They want to, add, they want to feel like they had some part in it. You have no part in it other than believing on him. You didn't pay for the gift. You're going to pay for your sins. If you want to pay for your, if you want to pay for that gift, this is how God's going to have you pay for it. Just go to hell. <laughs> because for the wages of sin is death. That's the way it works. Go to chapter 2. So after he finishes saying this, look what he says in verse number 1 of chapter 2. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came now with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. So he's given the, is he giving his own testimony? No, he's giving the testimony of God. By the way, another word for testimony is what? Witness. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. You see, we don't want people to stand and have faith in our words and my testimony. Why? Because of the fact that it's the gospel that has the power of God into salvation. Who cares about what we used to do? Who cares about the things that we're involved in? The only thing that can save someone is Jesus Christ, right? That's the testimony. That's the witness. Yeah. You know, I remember being in an old IFB church and people would take blessings. How many of you ever been in an old IFB church where you take blessings, okay? <laughs> Sunday school blessings. I enjoy those days, you know? Talk about what God has done. But every once in a while you'd get someone, you can tell that they're not giving glory to God. They're glorifying themselves. You know, you know what John the Baptist said? He says, I must decrease and he must increase. You know, and look, you're like, man, the church is growing. We're seeing a lot of people saved. Amen. And you know what? The, the reason why is because we're probably the weak things of this world. <laughs> we're probably the weak things. We're, we're foolish to the world. We're not the wise men. We're not mighty. We're not noble. So that way, when people look at the, our church and see the great works that are being done, they're not going to say it's because of us. They're going to say it's because of God. Because they'll say, those, those guys got no filter. Those guys are like, you hear that pastor? He's like cussing from the pulpit and like saying all kinds of stuff. And they don't want to fight everyone. Obviously, that's, those salvations were because of God. <laughs> not because of those people. That, those people are a motley crew, you know. And that's what we want. Amen? Go with me, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Because surely someone will say, well, how can you say the Apostle Paul never gave his testimony? There's so many verses in there where he did give his testimony, you know? There's so many times when he talked about him being a Pharisee and, you know, all the things that he did. Yeah, but not when he was preaching the gospel. Because our text verse that we get from the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 10 says that thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God will raise him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. It's testifying of God. Look at 1 Timothy 1.11. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful putting me into the ministry. So is he talking about salvation or is he talking about Serving. Serving. Verse 13, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. So here we see that the apostle Paul, yeah, he's talking about how he was a blasphemer. He's talking about how he was a persecutor and injurious, but what's the context of what he's talking about? Him serving the Lord. Amen. Ministry, right? Because of the fact that he's going to the apostles and they're like, hey, this guy used to like persecute us. Verse 14, and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Go to Philippians chapter 3. I don't think so. I think he, I think it was important that he gave his testimony. Well, let's see what the Apostle Paul thought of his testimony. And this, this attitude that he's going to show right here is the same attitude that all of us should have. Look at Philippians 3 verse 4. Though I might have also 
excuse me, that I might, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he must, he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe, tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteous, which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but done, that I may win Christ. There's your testimony. Amen. It's done. Right. Done means poop. Yep. <laughs> Dung means feces, which means something that has no value. And look, he's saying, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. You know, I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisee. I got the credentials. I got the pedigree. But you know what they mean to me? Dung means nothing that I may win Christ. Verse 9, and be found in him. Not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ and the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death. So there goes your testimony. And that's the same exact attitude that we should have. Amen. You know, if you did things in the past, count it but done. Right. Count it but done. You know, if you used to be a drunkard, a fornicator, it's done. It's done. Go to Ephesians chapter 5. Most of these phony testimonies are so filthy too, by the way. I heard that when they, these guys first came, they're like, we are saved from a wicked lifestyle. No one who listens to Pastor Anderson for four years uses that type of terminology. Right? I got saved from a filthy lifestyle? That's weird. And you know what that does? That raises suspicion. What do you mean by that? Right? Look at Ephesians 5 verse 1. Be therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. But fornication and, un and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know that no whoremonger nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame to speak, even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. So it's telling us here that these things are shameful. Don't think it's cool to talk about how drunk you were prior to Christ. I used to smoke so much weed, man. I was like token every day. Smoking bowls and buying marijuana. You tell me any kind of marijuana brand, I did it. That's shameful. You tell that to me, I'm going to tell you you're stupid. Amen. Stupid for telling me that and stupid because you smoke that much. You're probably stupid. Because marijuana kills brain cells, amen? That's why you can't pay attention in church. Ephesians 4.29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 15.33, be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. Now, let me just say this. If you've been involved in those things and that stuff comes up in conversation, you know, my wife was telling me about someone who, who, who divulged some information to her, but 
the person gave my wife the information in such a way that she has no idea specifically what she was referring to, but she knows that it was something that was not good. It wasn't sodomy or anything like that. The person just said, you know, I messed up my body pretty bad. So I got to work on, you know, kind of rebuilding my body, you know, eating healthy and doing certain things because prior to being saved, I just was not saved and I messed up my body pretty bad. That's all we need to know. Right? By the way, she could be talking about like heroin. She could be talking about crack. She could be talking about drugs. She could be talking about drinking, messing up her liver. We don't know. But the thing we do know is that this person was clearly ashamed of what they had done. They were ashamed. So they'd rather not give, in, give all the details. The people who want to give the details are the wicked people who like to hear about that stuff. And they're fishing to see if you like to hear about that stuff. That's what they're doing. They tell you to see if you perk up when you hear that so they can divulge more perversion and see if there's any reprobates in here that they can team up with. So look, if you're involved in any of those things and th those, that stuff comes up in conversation, give a very general response with shame. You should be able to blush when you talk about those things. You know what blushing means? It means you're ashamed. Shame facing this? I see you guys in the back talking because you're dark skin. I get it, okay? You can't blush. I already knew that was going to happen. There should be some shame, right? Because you're embarrassed. Look, and look, I, I wasn't like a gang member or anything, but the things that I've done, it, it shames me. I'm never going to talk to my kids about that stuff. I don't want my son and my daughter and my, my other son to know anything of those things. Why? Because it's a shame. <laughs> They're shameful things. You know, that's why, look, and like my mom has like all these pictures of me back in those days. <laughs> yeah, your mom's probably had the same thing of you. Any chance I get, I try to throw those things away when I, when I go over there. <laughs> those are memories, bad memories. People always tell me, oh, let me see a picture of you with your mohawk when you first got saved. No, that's a shame to me. <laughs> yeah, you'll never find it. <laughs> you'll never find it. And people always tell me, like, oh, man, I wish I could see a picture of that. I don't. You know, I never want people to remember me like that. That's BC, amen? Before Christ. So those stuff, you know, I moved on from that. And I don't want my kids to see that either. Why? Because there's shame. We should be ashamed. In fact, the Bible says, What fruit had ye then, ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? Amen. For the end of those things is death. Yeah. Romans chapter 6. We should learn to be ashamed. Shame is good. Amen? Amen. To have shame is good. When people can just divulge all kinds of perversion with no shame... There's a problem there. It means their, their, their conscience is seared. To the pure, all things are pure, but to them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. They're defiled themselves. So they have no governor of what is right. Reprobates have no governor in their mind to basically divulge any kind of filthy information. They just kind of let it all fly. Go to Psalm 119, if you would. And look... So this way, you know, and this is in Baptist churches. You know, give me your testimony. Let testify. Give me your testimony. And they got it from the liberals is where they got it from. That's where they got it from. And this is an important doctrine because of the fact that you always hear about people, even Baptists, talking about, well, I believe sodomites could be saved. I heard this one testimony, right, of some lesbian who got saved. And then you Google it up and you're like, well, she believes in like repenting your sins. You're just going to take that as face value? So, oh, but, but she said that was her testimony. I don't care. If, they, if, if, if it's not Christ and him crucified. And if they say they're burning in their lust one toward another. Sorry to break it to you. Homos can't be saved. <laughs> I'm not sorry to break it to you, actually. Psalm 119, verse 46 says, I will speak of thy testimonies also before kings and will not be 
ashamed. You see, our personal testimony should cause some shame, shouldn't it? But when we speak of God's testimony, there's no shame in that. That's why the Bible tells us to be spirit-filled when we go preach the gospel, because we preach, yes, with meekness and fear, but without shame. We speak with boldness. We speak with confidence. We speak unashamed of Jesus. When we go out there, oh, yeah, you know. <laughs> we go there, and we want to win them to Christ. <clears throat> Believe. Are, are you guys those once saved, always saved? Yep. Amen. That's me. Oh, we don't agree with that. Well, see ya. Aren't you ashamed of that? No, I'm not. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. We should not be ashamed of that. But in the contrast of that is my personal testimony. Yeah, I am ashamed of that. Amen. That's something I don't really want to talk about. You understand? But with other people, it's, like the, it's the other way around. These guys, they were ashamed of the gospel, but they were not ashamed of their filth. There's something wrong with that. Okay? Look at verse 144. The righteousness of thy testimonies is everlasting. Give me understanding and I shall live, the Bible says. And by the way, whenever someone tells you, oh yeah, but you know, you guys don't believe, you know, sodomites can be saved and you know, but I heard this testimony. This is what you tell them. The Bible tells me, thy testimonies, O Lord, are my delight and my counselors. So if I have some fag with some testimony saying that they turn over a new leaf and that they're a Christian and I have the Bible telling me that reprobates can't be saved, I go with God's testimony. If I have some, some cookie cutter faggot who's wearing a shirt and tie and he's in a Bible believing church and they say, oh yeah, he was burning in his lust, but God gave him victory over that sin. See, these, these homosexuals are also our brothers in Christ. I go with the testimony of God Amen. and say, he's lying. <laughs> Let God be true and never man a liar. Amen. I don't care how good the testimony is. And look, most of these freaks, when they divulge their testimony and you actually see what they believe, they're all repenting of your sins. Thanks, Mark. Every, he's right. Every single one of them. So the simple believe every word and are punished. You know what the simple do? Oh, they're you know, testimony. Say they're Christians. Let's just believe it. Why don't you go do your research? You'll find out that these people believe a false gospel. And look, I'm not talking about people who were coaxed by their pervert boyfriend to get involved in some homosexual act and they were disgusted by it i'm not talking about the, i'm not talking about the guy who was molested or whatever it may be you know that's different okay i'm talking about the people who burn in their lust and then they supposedly turn over a new leaf garbage false not true vainglory of a false testimony is what it is thy testimonies O lord are my delight and my counselors i don't care how convincing they are the, I get my counsel from God's word. And shame on people who want to who want to believe someone's testimony rather than God's testimony. Right. Oh, I know that's what the Bible says, but this person says this. I could care less. Amen. The Bible says they're full of deceit. Right. And look, even with with sodomites, you know, I'm thinking like these guys, they learn to say the right things. Yeah, they learn to say the right terminology, the right words, because they're trying to infiltrate. Go to 1 John chapter 5 and we're done. So when, if you hear of some homo getting saved, don't believe it. It's not true. It's false. You know. And the good thing about these guys who came to our church is that they were, because they were reprobates, they were foaming out their own shame. So all it took was for us to be with them for just a couple of hours. That's, what all, that's all it took. I never really had a long conversation with them in, at our church. Look at 1 John chapter 5, and we're, we're done here. For there are three that bear, verse, not, verse 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the, the, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. So remember, if we receive the witness of men, just remember this, the witness of God is always greater doesn't matter how convincing someone can be. And obviously these guys were not convincing at all. <laughs> but 
But let me say this, you know, our church is about to go independent in about a month. And over these last two years, we've had a lot of bozos come through here. But they are, these guys were the bozio of them all. They're the worst filth. They're walking feces in my eyes. Now, one of two things is going to happen hereafter. Either they're just going to get worse and worse, or they're going to become more subtle. You understand what I mean by that? So they're not going to be as outlandish and faggoty as these guys and just kind of like weird and quirky as these guys. They're probably going to become more subtle. And at that point, we need to remember, hey, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is always greater. You understand? So we do need to have the attitude in our church, suspect no one, trust no one. And look, I know there's guys here, they get mad at me because like I'm lenient with certain people. You keep getting mad at me, you suspect them, that's fine. I want to make sure that I have an attitude for our church that I just go ahead and just by default trust everyone. I want to give everyone the benefit of the doubt. And if you're mad at me for that, then too bad. <laughs> You're not going to change me. You understand? I want to give everyone the benefit of the doubt. And once someone shows themselves to be some wicked reprobate, then yes, at that point, we'll do what we did today. So, no, oh, you didn't see that? You didn't see that coming? What's up with you? What's wrong with you? Well, yeah, because I, I didn't talk to them. But look, if you, if you saw it coming and you didn't tell me anything, so who's, who's, who's the one who has the problem here then? Right? So we want to make sure that obviously we, we trust no one, suspect no one, and we just we understand that the witness of God is greater. And look, we don't want to have this attitude where like everyone comes in. Like today, I was like that. I'll just be honest with you. All right? I was like, I was just like, oh, who's this guy? How long have you been listening to Pastor Erickson? What you know about him? You know? Do you believe in a reprobate doctrine? I wasn't like that. But there's a temptation to be that way because of these freaks who came. But you know what this does for us? It heightens our senses of what it does. And you know what I'm interested in heightening the senses of? Not necessarily the ladies. I want to heighten the senses of the men. Because look, obviously, I'm not going to know every single Tom, Dick, and Harry that comes to our church. But you know, we should have eyes all over the church that keep an eye on things, hear things, and report them when needed. Because our church is doing great works for God, therefore a lot of these freaks are going to try to come in and infiltrate and try to hinder us in our work. You understand? So what's the sermon today? The sermon is, I'm glad we booted these freaking disgusting reprobates out of our church. Amen. Took the trash out! Amen. And we need to, and we need to make sure we use the right terminology when we talk about our salvation. Good. Right? And look, the next time someone comes to our church... Talk about their testimony. Either you correct them on the spot or you come get me and I'll correct them. Zero tolerance on that. I'm done with that. I'm done with giving someone the benefit of the doubt when it comes to that. Like, well, what about someone who hasn't heard the sermon? They better listen to the sermon online before they come here and fix that. Well, that's not fair. Well, that's why the sermons are online to see if you like the church or not. And if you don't like it online, you're not going to like it in person. That's why I put out the clips. I give you the hottest part of the sermon to see if you can get offended. If you don't get offended, you'll do great here. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this day. Thank you for our salvation. We're thankful that we had nothing to do with it. That you died on the cross for us. You paid for all our sins, past, present, and future. You paid, Lord, and you went to hell for us. You resurrected on the third day, and all we had to do was believe on you. And we are thankful for the redemption of our bodies. We understand that we're not delivered from those things as of yet and that we have the responsibility to walk in the Spirit to not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And I pray that you continue to, st continue to help us through that. Thank you so much for the tools that you've given in our lives to help us to have that victory on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it's our Bible, it's the, the Word of God, it's, it's prayer, it's the church, it's brothers. But uh, we also need to understand that we're not fully redeemed yet. We're still waiting for that. The day where we will no longer be tempted by sin. And um, we thank you for that glorious day, one day that will come. And we pray, God, that you continue to make manifest the folly of the infiltrators. And those who come, help us to have our uh, senses heightened, to be vigilant, and um, to trust no one but suspect no one as well. 
We want to make sure that we're friendly to everyone, that we love people, and but also understand that there are wicked people out there. There's reprobates who want to destroy us, destroy our church. And I pray that your hand be upon us continually. Uh, may you protect us and please destroy uh, Hafni and Fenehas out there and that they may not harm anybody else. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.